Good afternoon, everyone. Um, like she said, I'm Josh Chicago. Uh, today's guest lecturer, Jeffrey Johnson, um, as just mentioned, got his both his VR and his Master of Architecture here at Ball State. Uh, he pre uh, after that, he taught for a decade at Columbia University, uh, where he was the director of the Asia Mega Cities Lab and Studio X Beijing, or is that Studio Ten? X. X. You got it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in three decades of practice, Mr. Johnson has worked in Chicago, New York City, Vienna, Austria, and Rotterdam, uh, and the Netherlands. And for offices that include Acetope, Michael Sorkin Studio, and OMA Remco uh, Mr. Johnson was part of the design team that was awarded an AIA Presidential Citation in 2012 uh, for his work on the National September 11th Memorial and Museum while working with Davis Brody Bond Architects. The firm he co-founded, Slab, has also won numerous awards. Please join me in welcoming Jeffrey. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Sure. Okay, can everybody hear me? How's the audio? Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy and pleased to be back at my alma mater. Um, thank you for the invitation, Andrea and Josh. Um, I've been able to get back a couple of times since I graduated, but it's been a few decades since then. Uh, but it's wonderful to walk around uh, today with Andrea uh, with, and Josh to, to see the work, the output, the, the, the energy uh, remains here in the school. And, and I have a, so many wonderful memories of my education here uh, in this building. So. Anyway, I'm so pleased to be here, and thank you for, for coming out. Um, and it's also, I'm really pleased that, um, that CAP is giving away books today. So part of my book, I think Josh and I were talking last year. We talked about me coming and giving a talk on my research, uh, which makes up a lot of what this, the, the book is, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, but I also thought, what, after considering it a little bit, uh, I thought it would be a good idea to also just spread that, spread the talk um, across the breadth of, of some of my research, but also then include some of my practical work uh, from the office. And I tried to tie some of the work in the office to that, which led either into or as a consequence of some of that research. So not necessarily directly applied. Sometimes it's, the research is very academic and non-professional. But then we try to tie some of that in the, in the office to that research. So anyway, so it's the, the presentation will have a little of, little of, of both today. So, so I, um, in, in Josh's um, introduction, I happen to be working at the office of OMA uh, and with Rem Kulhas around 2000, 2001, 2002. And three, and that is at the time when OMA and Rem Kohlhaas founded also the sort of sister company to OMA, uh, AMO. And this, this, when this happened within the office, uh, it was a kind of key moment that Rem Kohlhaas recognized the value that was being produced for all architectural projects, the research value, and all the effort put in the office on architectural projects uh, for actual um, commissions uh, for purely research uh, purposes. So he founded AMO, which would, would focus the effort of the team on the research component, even the ability for the office to be hired to do research without an architectural outcome, let's say, for example. So it was a really interesting time. And this all came from work that was happening for the Fashion House Prada. At the time, so they, they were, OMA was asked to rethink the brand itself, the Prada. Uh, so in that effort, that really kick-started this idea of, of AMO, uh, which then really helped develop a kind of pathway for a way of thinking about practice and research, which actually could be uh, both um, uh, foundational for the way that the architectural practice works, uh, but also provide opportunities to produce purely research, an architectural kind of, an urban research within, within the office. So that helped kind of formulate a kind of way of thinking for many of us in the office, which then sort of translated into, later into to my both academic and professional uh, career. 
also which was stated while I was at Columbia University teaching, um, the, there was an opportunity at the time that both at the university level but also within the, the Graduate School of Architecture uh, uh, Planning and Preservation for kind of um, a way to think about the emerging field of architecture and urbanization into areas in, uh, of the world which were, let's say, non-typical to our Western understanding of an architectural um, education, or where we would have direct links, certainly through New York and others, to, let's say, Central Europe, Northern Europe, et cetera. So as part of an effort both at the university level but also at GSAP, uh, Dean Mark Wigley at the time started to establish uh, these um, sort of research outposts um, ar around the world. So these Studio X's uh, were, were being formulated uh, within those kind of emerging urban areas uh, to basically uh, participate in a conversation about the future of the city, which then obviously has a consequence on the future of architecture, right? So uh, as Josh said, a lot of my research started to focus on urbanization in China uh, and in the 2000s, uh, of which then when we opened Studio X in Beijing, um, I started to utilize uh, the infrastructure that we had in place in Beijing, China, which then right before I left Columbia to take the position at University of Kentucky as a director, I was then also um, running the Studio X in Beijing, which also included um, Tokyo and also South Korea. As a, as, a, as a kind of research, as a kind of research and curatorial kind of initiative, uh, all again in the spirit of uh, understanding the future of the city, right? So a lot of my foundational research had to do with those kind of initiatives that were formulated by leadership at, at, the, at the college and at the university level. So this is, this is the sort of folded out cover of the book, The China Lab Guide to Mega Block Urbanism. China Lab was the first, initiate, the first initiated research um, um, lab that I formed. It then became Asia Mega Cities Lab because I expanded out to the rest of East Asia for that research. But this was, this was um, as a kind of research team at Columbia, was, was our first, like, first step into understanding the city uh, within China. And that was through large-scale urban development, which is basically the super block. Large-scale blocks uh, being designed and built, one at sort of rapid speed, certainly with China, and certainly over the last, so just to put that in perspective within China, that China urbanized within one generation the same amount of time it took America to urbanize in 100 years, and it took Europe 200 years to urbanize at the rate that China urbanized from basically 1980 till, till today, right? So cities were booming everywhere in China. So again, as a field of study uh, at Columbia University, there was a need for someone to be studying that and researching that, that phenomenon in, in, in China. So I was the one uh, that was fortunate enough uh, to, to be able to spend a lot of my research time, uh, and then later some of my practice, uh, focusing on China for, for Colombia. So our first step into the Chinese city was through the lens of large-scale development, right? So this was the beginning of our research that started in about 2008, 2009. Um, and so we looked specifically at this scale. Now one of the most fascinating things about the super block or the mega block is it is both urban and architectural. It is both of those scales at the same time but in many cases does neither well, right? So, so it's a really interesting kind of phenomenon. And we can think about uh, the, scale, the scale of this urbanization, the scale of these mega blocks could be anywhere between 30,000 people to 100,000 people or more living within a walled enclave, right, of new development. So for us, the value of looking through the lens of large scale super block development was that actually not to look for suggestions to improve urbanization or superblock within China, but to look for clues 
for new models of urbanization and architecture that can offer us alternative models for the urbanization of the world into the future. So it's basically a learning from kind of process, right? What can we learn from it? Again, not to offer alternatives for, for China, but again, to look for actually uh, uh, advantageous phenomena within that kind of um, development uh, to offer us models for the future. So that was the intent uh, as we initiated the, to, the research uh, within China. And some of these just, we can see the kind of repetition and the scale and, the, and in many cases the monotony of this kind of urban, this urban development, right? And again, often, oftentimes at just huge scales. So that was a kind of within an urban environment. And I, and I have a lot of images, a lot of, a lot of excerpts from the book. I will try my best not to get into too much detail into a lot of it because it can get really detailed. So I've tried to just provide enough to highlight some of those. But not only is this phenomenon happening within the center of cities, this was also happening on the edge conditions of cities, right? As the cities grew, the cities continued to expand, like in America, outward, like pancakes, right? Just continue to build out, but expand out into the countryside where you'd have these, these para-urban zones, which just had this completely and incredibly radical kind of situations where you'd have countryside and in large scale mega block development, right? There's no, the, the, the phenomenon of the kind of the, the suburban sprawl the shopping malls and the strip malls and, and that kind of field, uh, urban field that we experience in America and in many cases in Europe doesn't, doesn't exist within China. It is abrupt. The city ends, but when the city ends, it doesn't end with a little house, you know, a neighborhood of single family houses, right? It ends with a super block development with 30 towers, right? Have anybody been to China? Anyone from China? So, I mean, the other thing is that it's incredible, when you take like a train, a high-speed train, let's say between Shanghai and Beijing, you, will be, you could be on that train for 40 minutes and be out in the countryside, and then all of a sudden from nowhere, you will see four of these developments happening, seemingly in the middle of the countryside, right? So this kind of phenomenon, it is not, it is not it's a different model of urbanization than that we are used to in America, where it's, it's about, like if we think about Manhattan, right, it's on a small module, right? You develop a city on a small module, you build it one piece at a time, right? And it evolves. What's happening with the rapid urbanization of China and elsewhere is it has to happen instantaneously to accommodate the millions and millions and millions of people migrating from the countryside into the city. And so their planning, their planning isn't small modules. It's not 25 feet by 100 foot lots. It is 600 feet, 900 feet by 900 feet, or even more, right? Then given to a developer, given to an architect to basically design, right? So the growth of the city and its evolution is happening at a huge scale. It is not happening incrementally, right? At least incremental at a small scale. You can say it's incremental at a huge and gigantic scale, right? So again, these are all reasons like we felt this is absolutely fascinating as a body of research to understand the accommodation of millions of people migrating to the city. Right. This, this, this example I show is very similar to the last. These are actually the person, a little blur, the person in the foreground actually is one of my students. We did a case study um, in one of my studio projects at Columbia where we looked at a, a, a rural village which was being usurped by Beijing. Basically, basically Beijing has expanded its, its network of um, commuter rail out the metro, out into the countryside so Beijing can expand. And so we identified a, a rural village which was becoming an urban village, meaning it was being usurped by Beijing. We did a study uh, on that village while it was still a village, and then we went back three years later, and that village is basically what you see. It's gone, it's completely gone. Everyone being removed from the village, and one super block after the other were being built, 
right? So this, again, the phenomenon of that, even tracking that phenomenon of urban growth, uh, and again, at this scale, um, uh, was so significant. So not only are we talking about urbanization, as I said, as it expands to the countryside, a distinction of what we see also is, is the, the affordability of housing for migrant workers coming from the countryside into the city. Oftentimes, they'll find housing in the countryside where farmers have built up where they were, they were, they were basically their accommodation was a single family home as part of a village that then farmed the cooperative of that farmland. What each farmer started to do was actually build up multi-story houses without architects, without planners, on their single home plot for actually people to rent. So what happens is these are all migrant workers coming from the countryside. The farmer became a landlord. Farmers moved off to a super block somewhere and now, all, most, for the most part, all those are migrant workers that are working in factories or other service-oriented jobs. So this urbanization happens at a kind of superblock model, but also happens now this, the, in this kind of informal model and the perimeter and the countryside. Uh, again, this is all illegal, right? I mean, as far as the government sees it, this is illegal construction, right? So just this mass urbanization uh, is incredibly fascinating. Equally, these are rural villages. And then as a model, so then the rural village, it starts to expand. And then there's an effort, actually a very interesting one, that was, was, was happening just as I culminated some of this research um, on the urbanization, actually a planned re-urbanization, or an urbanization as a return to the countryside in China to move some of the migrant workers back to the countryside. But then creating these little these little nodal pockets of, of dense village planning as a kind of new model for a dense rural lifestyle, right? So really fascinating. So that, that's like now, now an increasing, increasingly new model of moving populations back to the countryside. But that kind of model of urbanization also built on a kind of scale of the courtyard house and things like that. So really fascinating. The, the result of accommodating like these again million hundreds and hundreds of millions of people moving moving into the moving into the um, city so and I'll just go through this quickly so part of the research because it was also at the, at, a, at a school is that we would generally do research through summer workshops in Beijing or in Shenzhen or in Shanghai wherever we might go in the summer and I would take students for six weeks and we would do foundational research. We would bring some of that research back. And then in the studio, in a spring studio, graduate studio, we would actually then speculate. Take some of those findings and then speculate on those topics to produce kind of alternative urban models. Um, and then that would then feed back into the next summers. And th those students would travel, get to travel to China also. And then we would feed back into the research, this, this kind of research, speculation, research, outcomes, speculation, et cetera. So, so that was kind of a process that I was using um, with, within, the, within the academic environment. Uh, and we see some of, the, some of these actually quite radical kind of plans. Some would actually use it as a kind of form of critique, right, as a kind of urbanization, like the super dense map building, right, as a kind of super block within, that's in Beijing, right? And again, won't go through each of these projects, but I'll just share them as examples. But to take some of the density, what's in the FAR of one of the super blocks, and then pack it out into a map building, right? So it's like, take that density and say, what if? You know, we, we create this, this labyrinth of a, of a kind of super block with commercial under. Historic, the, the, the Hutong neighborhoods, which were being destroyed um, rapidly, and certainly during and up until the um, up to 2008 Beijing Olympics. So there were these kind of speculations on preservation, right? New building over the old kind of idea of building a kind of super block or blocks up and above the kind of historic courtyard houses within Beijing, for example. This is in Guangzhou, uh, taking a kind of urban village kind of model and density into a kind of map building and verticalizing that kind of mat structure. 
So anyway, these, so the students would gain from some of the research and then we would speculate on, on different forms. Each studio was based on a, on a different scenario, a different context, different site. For example, this one had to do with the extension of high-speed rail between Tianjin and Beijing. Again, rents the countryside, all of a sudden these nodal points of urban development happen right along these kind of satellite towns along the, along the rails. And so we had one student that speculated on a brand new like urban you know, transit oriented development, like super block on top of the train you know, kind of idea as it expands out. And this included manufacturing and education and training and all those kind of things. And you see the kind of scale of that section. Right, so, so each, in each case, we took a different phenomenon, each studio tested something and speculated on, on that. So the book, um, again, the book, the idea of the book was both, as I said, uh, to look at urbanization through the lens of the super block and look for opportunities in those, in what was happening in China to provide opportunities for urbanization elsewhere, right? And we thought about the book kind of in two parts. One as a kind of catalog, so to actually analyze super blocks, to actually really pull apart different projects, analyze different super blocks that exist. The second part then would be essays and contributions from other experts, architects, scholars, uh, et cetera, uh, on the topic itself with then our own, our own kind of um, research um, filtering through the whole book. Okay, so this is basically the, the, the chapters are divided up in these, uh, in the larger bubbles. Um, the, so those broke down the actual structure of the book, it was based on those chapters. So that we found contributors, we, we, offer, we, we provided our own research on each of those topics and then we found contributors uh, uh, to write essays for each of those. Or we did interviews and we'll see those. So we took, we, we selected the most basic, what we thought was the most typical and basic super block, and this one is in, in Shanghai, and really pulled it apart, like in the beginning of the book, uh, and really pulled apart the parts and pieces and description of that, and, and so this was really a key um, example for us because this one repeats a number of times throughout the whole book. Uh, but, but again, it, it identifies uh, and demonstrates the kind of, the, the basic model uh, of superblock, which again is an internalized, for example, internalized urban organization. So it's not extrovert, it's internalized. It has a wall around the entire structure. It, is, it has uh, a basic formula for development. Uh, and, and those, the different kind of types of buildings, uh, there were six different types of buildings and those were just extruded and repeated to meet the, the kind of FAR. Uh, they all had orientation, which is generally east-west orientation for almost all buildings in China. And they had certain amenities within each one. So each one is ideal, each had like a kindergarten or daycare, and it had certain commercial aspects uh, within each of the super blocks. So in many ways, these, these are autonomous urban units that existed within a city, and one can imagine one after the other I mean, you ba your basic daily needs could be accommodated within the walls of the super block, right? And then you imagine this as a model of urbanization repeated one after the other, right? So it is a completely different urban model than what, let's say, in the West we're used to, or like in America, or let's say our historical cities. Like, you know, the idea of strolling down the street, right, having kind of uh, uh, sort of social exchanges as you walk down the streets, the kind of flaneur, right, looking in the shops and enjoying. This is a completely kind of urban experience, right? You can walk a quarter of a mile with a wall to your side on the sidewalk, right, with, with gates, with, with guarded gates to get into each of these, into these enclaves, right? So, so a completely different way. So in many ways, and, and this is a kind of, you know, a lesson for all, like you have to, you have to allow yourself to step back, right, as researchers and to think about this objectively and not just be critical of this as an urban, as an urban model because it's contrary to what we know and what we imagine is that idealized kind of European urban experience, right? 
It's not to say one's good and bad. I mean, you have to break. So, so for us, it was one of those things, too, that we could immediately jump to being critical. But to actually really break through for our research, we had to look at it very objectively. Like, why is this working? Why is this the model? Why is this, why is this what, what is actually producing the, the urban environment within China? And then ultimately, what are, what are the possible consequences of that? Right? And that, that, is the, that, is the, that is the key to all that, right? <clears throat> we also included, so we have a catalog that's 100 projects as part of the book. And we did include, we included about 10 international examples just to kind of have, a rel just have something to compare it to. And so we, we see those examples here, the red tags, it doesn't, it doesn't matter to read those. But so they're tagged on this map. And then these are the cities within China that we identified super blocks to include in the book. And then we did a map of super blocks within each of the cities. And then we tagged and read which super blocks we had in the catalog. Right? I mean, we do not identify every single super block in all of China. Or did we then have a choice of you know, picking from 15,000 super blocks, what are the best 100 to, to do? It, no, we, we identified those that we had come across or that we found in our research as significant and significant for some reason to include in. We don't necessarily have the biggest, or the smallest, or the oldest, or the newest, or the most unique, right? But we did try to identify every single one for a, some reason, right, within, within the catalog, right? So there's just the, the list of those, the super blocks. And then this was the basic. We worked with two by four, the graphic designers, on the book design, uh, New York-based graphic designers that we worked a lot with at OMA. Uh, and then our team actually developed the graphics for the, for the rest of the book. Uh, so this was, our sing this was a single page within the book on the, on the super block catalog. Right? And there's certain things we identified for, for each one. And I'm just going to flip through them. I might stop at one or two. I'm not going to go through all the 100. But again, we try to find unique enough projects so then the comparison. The idea is then you'd have a catalog where you can compare and contrast distinctions and differences um, for each of them. And we, did, we, we identified certain things like accessibility, like how far away from a metro or subway, how far is it to the airport, how far is it from a highway. So every superblock, we kind of identified a distance to the center of the city. So we understood geographically, again, the location, like how, how uh, um, accessible is that? So many of them are on the perimeter of cities, right? And some are interiorized. And some, and some of these projects we identify, like this on, on the left, West Cologne, we saw maybe some of you recognize the, the um, whoops, sorry, wrong direction. Cologne Walled City is torn down. So even like, because of the extreme nature of the Cologne Walled City, this no longer exists, but probably the densest, most urban kind of block, informal, right? Um, certainly within, within our, our contemporary history, right, as a kind of condition to study, right? But then to the most contemporary, like the West Kowloon block, it's hard to tell. We see those multiple towers built up, but it's, it's all built up on a podium. And that podium's like shopping, big shopping mall inside. And it's hard to grasp the scale of this building. Again, it is like at least a quarter of a mile around that building. And basically, there are two entrances into that building on the ground floor. It is all connected through subways and metro and taxis at multiple layers. I don't have a section for today's talk, but it is such a fascinating building. But what it does to a kind of urban experience is extreme. Again, it is not about the pedestrian, at least the pedestrian outside of the building, right? It is about being connected to a network that moves people through cities to airports, to wherever, to other nodes of urbanization. Um, and, and through a network of infrastructure, not through a kind of stroll down the, the main street, right? It's a, it, again, just a, it's a completely different model, 
So that, this, this West Colon, just as an example, it's here. And I, that would be the entire like downtown Muncie. One big podium with all those towers. I mean, probably campus, Ball State, almost half a campus at least, the scale of what this building is, right? And it's a single building, right? With, with like two ways in, if you're not a car or a train, you know? So it, it is an extreme kind of condition, right? But it's like luxury housing, actually. Urban villages here, like again, this is informal settlement within cities, but the way that those work, similar to that, that model in the, in the countryside, that used to be farmland, that used to be the single home of a farmer. Shenzhen, the city overwhelmed the, the rural environment. So the farmers decided that we're gonna build six-story buildings instead to house migrants, right? So this is a different model for that. And they build these things and there's about three feet in between each one. And they're like six, you know, six stories tall. Data comparison, I won't go into that, but again, we just want to use it as, again, this is the idea of a, of a, as a, of a catalog as for comparative information of each of those super blocks, the 100 super blocks. So I'll quickly go through the other, this, the other chapters. So we went through the kind of history, so every chapter had a timeline. So the history, the history of the city within China, so that's a long history. Uh, obviously, within China, even though it's like agrarian culture, the kind of seat of power, economic, um, the economic centers were always cities. All right, within cities, even within agrarian culture, uh, but their history of actually urban design and planning goes back 2,000 years, with drawings, with with characteristics and and some design uh, criteria that still exist today. Uh, and again, we looked at those international examples in the history of, of housing and housing types um, within China. And this is, this is the kind of sketch that's like 2,000 years old, which is the basic model for a city in China, right? Which still, again, as I said today, this is, this is Xi'an, or Chang'an at the time, and that was the kind of urban model. But already thousands of years ago, the city, the city within China was already developing around large-scale blocks. And then this is the kind of hutong, the kind of alleyways and courtyard houses within, within Beijing, which are all in these large blocks. And then each of these alleys or hutongs actually at some point in time would have control points around them to create a perimeter. Uh, again, so we discovered actually there, there are remnants and echoes of the super block in ancient Chinese city making, right, for a lot of it. And a lot of it had to do as planning as a kind of instrument, right, to control, right, also people, how that works. I mean, you can keep people in, you can keep people out, right, when you put a wall around uh, something. So um, very interesting, you know, kind of comparisons historically and then the sort of courtyard house. The also under Mao Zedong, the, the kind of idealized city, um, was also a productive city. So for, for Mao, the ideal urban development model was a super block, but a super block that was based a, around production. So this was called the Donway. And, and so this model also was fascinating because this was exactly the idea that you are assigned as a citizen to a Donway. It could be a university, it could be a factory but you and your family live within this super block and all of your daily necessities are provided for you and you are, there's no need for you to ever leave the compound. And so that was the idealized urban model borrowed from many things from super block and others from the Soviets and other planning preceded it uh, pre-1940s but was a kind of basic model that, that Mao was trying to kind of promote, right? All kind of super block, all based on, so, so again. But it's also so, like the kind of notion of a social, a social housing model as well, right? All of your daily needs are provided for you within the walls of that compound, right? And how you associate yourself and your identity is directly related to that Don Wei or that compound. Or we look at it another way, your neighborhood, right? 
in a certain way. But again, as an urban model, it was completely inclusive, right? Or exclusive in a way that it was in, internalized as a thing, not externalized, right? It was not connecting to other parts of the city at all. And again, we looked at the kind of history of the, their urbanization through policy. Uh, we'll see there's a chapter on policy, but also the basic unit, which a lot was borrowed from, from again, modern planning. So the, the basic urban you know, unit from 2,000 people as it built up to become a larger city, et cetera. So a lot of the early super blocks were from modernist Pl Clarence Perry and other urban planners, but also Soviet models of how big they are, what's the scale, what's provided within each one. Again, the idea is that they are enclaves, right, that provide all the, all the needs that you have um, in the daily life. <clears throat> the history of the growth of the city within China, and here's a kind of block con comparison, right? So we see, obviously, there are others, you know, other large-scale blocks. But even Beijing, if we look at a typical block, now, again, there is internalized structure to them, but this is like almost 800 meters square. Like that is huge, right, as a block, right, as a, as a single entity. So again, the capacity and the, the typical scale of what those block structures are. <coughs> uh, again, we looked at basically, I within China, they have to do a new, they have to do kind of a new master plan every five years for the growth of their cities. So we kind of looked at the history of the cities Again, in this growth, in this part, is all very contemporary. It's all within the last 40 or 50 years, right, this kind of urban growth. Um, but this idea of satellite cities was really the model that, that China has followed. Like, you have your main center city, and then you connect by infrastructure to satellites. And then as that expands, you do another round of satellites within, within satellite towns. Uh, within each of each of those urban areas, and what we've and what's happened, and you, and, you, and you separate those by green spaces. And what's happened in both Shanghai and Beijing is those green spaces are all gone. The city just grew too fast. So the realization is even those satellite towns were not built far enough away because they just became bedroom towns, right? Because they're just basic people commuting into the the main city. So they're already building further and further away. So one of our contributions, Young Ho Chang, who, who taught here when I was a student here, I don't know if many, he was, was, has his own practice, he was the chair at MIT for a number of years and taught at other places, is probably, he is, he is kind of considered the first post, let's say post Mao, post pure communist, um, state within China, the sort of first private practice within China since before Mao. So when he returned to China, um, he set up a private practice. And so this, this contribution to the book has, is, is an interview, but also a project, uh, which he was actually, he's very much counter and against the kind of super block development. So for him, he's, he's always trying to find an effort in his practice to counter the large-scale uh, uh, superblock model. So this project, he was asked basically to do a, a superblock development, um, and what he decided to do uh, instead of the superblock was to break it down into smaller components, right? And so this, this project uh, is actually very small blocks, streets, very, very pedestrian, and like, it's a really interesting story. I mean, how he actually had to convince the developer to, to, to actually execute this project in the end because it, it didn't, to the developer, the developer saw multiple large, larger buildings with a lot of green grass and parking lots that separated them, and again, with a kind of wall built a, about, around it, right? So he really fought that as a model and offered a kind of alternative to it, right? Super dense, lower scale, walkable, city, right? And you can see, I mean, it's, it's, and you can look at its perimeter. It's like on the edge of a city, uh, but this really won the counter. So it is something that's porous, right? It's not opaque. You can walk into it, you can walk around it, and it's open city. 
this does not seem extreme when, whatsoever if we know our Western models of, of urban development. But again, for China, this is extreme, right? To have a developer that allows for you to have this kind of porosity and scale of building types uh, within, within the development models in China, economic models. And we had some photographers do some drone footage. So I'm just going to flip through these so you, again, just get the flavor a bit. Right, of this kind of monotony, right, of these models. Even some that are sort of townhousey. So I think just in China, it's prohibitive to actually build a single family home. Right? So you basically are going to live in an apartment, right, of some sort. So there are, there are things within, again, it's a central government that controls the land and all policy. So on one of those things we look for sustainable futures, you know, models is like they are not suburbs as we know it, right? They're not single family houses and neighborhoods. They're basically super blocks as the suburbs, right? But even that example, like they look townhouses, right? So they, they get some facts. I mean, even in the foreground here, a little bit lower height density uh, again. But you can just see again, this is also kind of an edge city, Beijing. Policy, again, we looked at the, the change in policy. Again, China, China was, again, under Mao then all the way up to 1979 or so, very close to the world. Housing was provided for everyone, right? So market housing as we know it really had started till into the 80s. So, like, so developers did not exist in China. Private arch architectural practices did not exist in China for those years. So this phenomenon now of market rate housing and all this development's all, again, been that during this, this period of time. So we kind of tracked those changes in, in urban policy and what the effect that's, that's had. Again, I'm just gonna go through some of these. The economy, again, that, this is what's fueled. Basically, China going through industrialization, right, later than us, later than Europe and other parts of the world, right? So this industrial boom created the mass migration of people to the city, right? So just tracking the economics uh, uh, across China and then how it influences and changed its policies, economic policies opening up to the world in 1979 uh, through special economic zones, et cetera, and how that is then fueled, fueled like urban development. Right, so they, the basic model is still very similar to here now. I mean, it's, it's like a developer will develop uh, these big chunks of urban air, land. Sales, you know, we did apartment comparisons. Society, also just the change in society and the transformation or evolution of society. And you can imagine the, as China started to open up to the rest of the world again, and those policies, and certainly as what, as a central government is being provided for social welfare for the population and providing for housing to make housing now market rate, obviously those things have a, have a serious impact. And the accumulation of land to then develop on uh, has a huge effect on displacement of, of, many, of many populations, right? The central government or municipal government has rights to all land within urban areas. They use eminent domain to remove people to then develop a big chunk of the city, offer to a developer, and they build up. So obviously that has social consequences, right, um, within China, the way that the cities are transforming. <coughs> Housing policy, part of that reform. But the other thing is, again, as we look, again, this is that, that typical model. We also wanted to pull apart what a super block or the mega block was as a social structure itself. Right, it's a little bit back to the idea of a neighborhood, right? The benefits of a neighborhood, of which the social structure within China was always based on a kind of neighborhood, a neighborhood plan. So this as a kind of neighborhood model, the structure which, which is slowly transforming from one of a top-down authoritarian, one of surveillance and other things that happen within the control of this, um, within a neighborhood, to one now providing amenities and other social benefits, right? But again, all of this is happening at the scale of the block, 
right? And what are these blocks then offering at that? And then what happens also informally as so a social structure within the super block? So this is a lot of, a lot of individual interviews with people, you know, they're living in, the, in, in these blocks of how they use, excuse me, that, that infrastructure, that social network within that block system uh, to, to uh, assist them uh, in, in their daily lives, uh, et cetera. Right? So there's a lot of benefits right, to be belonging to this, this sort of uh, community within that block. Also, the, the benefits for sustainability also, because obviously it's dense, it's controlled, but it's built at a large scale. So you can imagine it, the, what you can plan for when you're building a big chunk of the city, one piece at a time, how that can actually be uh, a more sustainable model as we think about uh, it, the resources that are used for uh, this kind of dense model. And certainly you can imagine this versus a kind of typical single family house residential you know, suburban development versus like this, this model. But other, but other um, uh, a lot of other principles and, and policies that are really promoting more green and sustainable practices within the development of these blocks, right? How they provide power, geothermal, lots of, lots of opportunities. And, and certainly in, in, in those that we would consider like really positive examples, right? There, there, are, there are a lot of benefits to, to, to that. Um, even to this, the, even showing as an example, you know, what are those benefits at kind of this scale, right, in the, in the book. And Stephen Hole contributed um, to the book, and he also did an interview like Young Ho Chang did, um, but we also used for him the linked hybrid project, which is the image here uh, on the right, um, if you're maybe familiar with this. But this was also a kind of alternative to the closed block or the walled off block. Right, so we found it was really interesting, and Stephen Hall also teaching at Columbia, so he was a, he was always um, a, a good contributor to the conversation about development within China. So his model also, like Young Ho Chang's, proposed um, an urban block that had no gates and no walls, right, and put a lot of public programming in the center of the block. So what you see those interesting kind of faceted. Um, um, tulip-shaped kind of structures in the middle or as, as uh, movie theaters. We had the kind of drum behind it was a hotel. The, the ring on top was a kind of semi-public fitness and other kind of amenities um, uh, for, the, for the housing project. And then along the ground floor of all the buildings were commercial, bookstores, cafes, restaurants, etc. So it brought people from outside into the block. Again, contrary to, to the model, right, where there's usually gated and the wall. So this was really Stephen Hall's kind of proposal um, for a kind of alternative model, right, to the typical um, Chinese, Chinese development. So five years, if, if not less, uh, after the completion of the project, the developer went back to Stephen Hall and said, sorry, it's not working. The people living here want a wall around the, the project. And Stephen Hall refused to put a wall around the development. Um, so the developer basically said, fine, and we're going to find someone else to design the wall for us. So now the linked hybrid has this wall built around the entire block with three or four entry points that have guards. Now, you can sort of go walk through it, walk past the guards to go in, in the movie theater and other things are sort of still there. Uh, but you can't linger or loiter. Like even with students, I take students to take photographs. We're there five minutes and they're telling us to leave, you know, unless you go into the cafe or to that. So, so even the effort uh, of trying the kind of alternative model, what happens is, is um, you know, the, the developer comes back and puts a wall around it, right? Again, we can be critical of that, but we can also say, oh, okay, what is this, you know, phenomenon of, of the reason this, this wall is so necessary, right? This is in Cheng, Chengdu, also another alternative by Stephen Hall, which is in the book, uh, the poor, the poor serosity, uh, sliced porosity block, excuse me, right? A similar model where it's a big open block plan, right? This is more commercial than residential, but, but again, he, Stephen Hall working contrary to the basic model. So again, a really interesting kind of 
there are some architects working, as I, as I showed, against the basic typical model of, of, of superblock. And then lastly, uh, within the book, is this notion of exportation. So what's also happening uh, that what we found, not only were we looking at the, the, the superblock or the megablock as a way to think where its positive benefits could provide us clues for urbanization, providing for urbanization elsewhere, in the future, China was also actually exporting this urban model to other parts of the world, uh, usually in a swap for resources uh, around the world. So what they would do, they'd come in and build a new city or build some infrastructure. They would agree to, agree to build this new city in exchange for whatever that might be. You know, it might need the infrastructure to, ex to extract certain resources from that area right, or whatever the, whatever the agreement was, but that basically they would use the superblock model as the model for urbanization, and basically the, the, the um, planners, architects, et cetera, developers, a lot of times construction workers, actually all were from China. They would design the project for, for Africa or other places. The contractors and the workers would all move to there, and they would actually build the kind of instant city, the kind of instant Chinese city in these other locations, all based on this kind of super block model. So we already kind of see this notion of the exportation of this, this model, uh, of this is Chinese model. And again, it's not, the super block is, was, it also has a history in, in modern architecture and other things. It's, it's not unique in the Soviet Union, et cetera. It's not a unique uh, way of thinking about urbanization, but it's sort of an extreme model at, at scale of which the, in China that it's happened, right? And in the pace of which it's happened. So we kind of broke that whole system down, like understanding like how that actually works is unfunded, right, in the design process for that. <clears throat> okay, so the, the last thing that, that looked like mostly all, but I'm gonna produce my research today, so the practice, let me just go quickly. But the other phenomenon that's happening and running parallel, which, which is a research project of which I have um, reinitiated, uh, has to do with the museum in China. So what's happening simultaneous with this urban growth was also the, the exportation of soft power and culture around the world, but also the promotion from the central government to the municipalities to build more cultural facilities within the city. Um, so on the surface, very beneficial, right? You know, museums, libraries, cultural centers, opera houses, etc. cetera. Uh, what that produced essentially was a huge building boom of museums across, uh, across China and within cities. And what that did is it tracked against with the economics, with everything else. So, so um, 3,400 museums were built in mainland China in like in one year. In America, the most I could find it ever built was like 200, right? So there's this huge, so what this happened, very similar process. Let's look at the construction of what's happening uh, and the design of these museums uh, and see if there we find clues of what that museum of a future could be by looking at what's happening at this kind of rapid pace of the museum. And in often cases, um, you know, what we saw, like, the, the and again, these are just some of the, the, the graphic, you know, explaining the kind of basic, the goals and initiatives of what the Chinese government set out. Um, but if they were gonna build 100 museums for the next 15 years, right, it equals already what all, that was kind of their goal. But it was also, like, the number of museums that existed all in England, right? So that they had rapid goals. Like, this wasn't gonna happen over 100 years. This was gonna happen in 10 years. Right? We're going to equal museums to England and other developed countries. We're going to have just as many museums of, 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 that they do. Right? So oftentimes, and then we kind of took a look again, per capita and things of that, that nature um, within China. But what often happens, what we, we noticed is like actually most of those museums didn't have a collection, didn't have a curator, didn't, it was basically just to build a shell, right? And it was part of a kind of this, this pro-development, this pro-building, right? As cities urbanized, we need to have the new, new city center, right? So in every city center, we need a library, opera house, 
all these kind of these building types. So great for architects. But architects were given the program design a museum. What kind of museum? Well, we don't know what kind of museum, but design a museum. And the municipal government would be charged of that, but there would be no experts to really work with the architects. So the architects were left to just coming up with the, whatever museum they wanted to design. Sounds like a fun studio project, doesn't it? You know, just design a museum. But that's what happened. So then they're not, they're actually not designed for any specific program or content, so they're not necessarily useful when there actually is a use for them. So many of them still sit empty, or they're rented out, right? Thousands of museums were designed and built, some of them absolutely spectacular architecture, right? But we see this kind of surplus, this extreme surplus of, of, of resources and, and um, architecture, right? All part of this huge this building boom. Um, and that's just another kind of a comparison of the, the, the magnitude of building uh, these museums. <clears throat> and similar in spirit, this is a kind of, in our book, a fold-out timeline of the history of museums within China, but also below is the kind of, a kind of selective history of museums around the world. And then we see some of the, again, like a catalog too. We have 100 plus kind of art museums that we cataloged. Uh, and there are artists and other architects, Ai Weiwei, that were part of the project, and we interviewed a number of times uh, for it. And then some of, the, some of the outcomes. So we did a number of exhibitions and things that had to do, but these are our drawings. So we scaled up because, again, the scale of some of these were enormous. Um, some of the museums planned from ZID to OMA to others. So we, we kind of did a scalar comparison that was part of that research from the smallest to the largest and create a kind of wallpaper out of those, those, museum, those museum plans. Uh, and, and equally, the, as a speculative model, uh, we, I use this kind of studio environment to, to create those alternative, alternatives to that. So we are, as part of the research, not only looking at the museum boom in China, but also um, the idea of the, the, the art market that it's globalization, the, the idea of art as commodity, but also the, the um, growth of the free port, which is a kind of tax-free zone, and where they're building specifically for the storage of art. But if you can buy and sell artworks within these, these free ports without taxation, and then you can store them. And so this was also burgeoning uh, as a building type um, around the world. A lot of it was happening in China and Asia with that economy booming. So we are looking also as part of our research at the Freeport and the Freeport, the architecture of the Freeport. And so we kind of combined that project of the, of the large scale museum with the Freeport. Um, and then again, some of the students speculate that, you know, what, what a large scale storage facility, Freeport slash museum public thing could, could be, right, as a, as a kind of form of alternative model, right? Uh, you see that, and one I thought just was fascinating because you kind of fly in and fly out. The collectors would fly in, get shuttled off. Usually, these free ports are somewhere near an airport. Um, you do your trading, you look at the work. They have like gallery spaces within these buildings, uh, and then uh, basically, then you fly back. You know, you buy and sell, and you head back to your private plane, and you you fly back to where you came from. So the one of our students actually then filled in the gap between two of the terminals within the Beijing airport and actually put a free port at the airport and became part of the experience of, of you as a traveler. You'd go through this kind of museum free port uh, experience within the Beijing um, uh, airport. Uh, so again, that's, that's you know, now a project. So we're doing a studio right now on the F Museum of the Future at Kentucky, which is really exciting. Um, so this is sort of the next phase. That's not a published um, work yet, but hopefully uh, this, this next phase of, of that uh, will help me, push me along to produce this kind of, produce another publication or something from the research on the museum. Okay, so I think, didn't time this for a while, so we got the research part anyway, so the plus practice has to be another time, I think. So, but, but some of this, uh, again, the, 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 the way in which a lot of this research goes from whether it's an academic environment to one of pure curiosity or within the practice 
is then we were commissioned or were along a lot of large scale master planning projects, came out of China, based on the, I mean in part from the research and being part of the conversations within China on kind of large scale development, being invited to be part of those projects, to look at master planning and a kind of large scale in China, also included some cultural projects. And in some cases it was master planning, a kind of large scale part of a city which included cultural cultural projects in museums as part of that urban development. So that way that that that, that application where opportunities came through that through the research then by getting that expanding that conversation on those topics, we were then being asked to then come in and offer. Not not as not as the kind of studio acts or part of the academic part, but as our practice to come in and then uh, see if we can apply some of those, some of those findings um, in, into the real world projects. So anyway, well, thank you. And um, answer any questions anyone might have. Good questions. I mean, so the even before the, the most recent, like the, the sort of economic crisis of real estate, the, the concern of the real estate bubble in China happening there, were already the, there were already many parts of cities or new development of cities, and then whole cities almost that were like ghost towns, right? And that phenomenon has, like, for one, there's a couple of reasons. Why and one one has to do with where where someone in China could invest. There weren't a lot of options to invest any surplus income that you'd have uh, in China. You didn't really have an ability to invest out of China for many. You had stock market, so a lot the the, the, the a lot weren't comfortable with investing in um, in the stock market. So real estate was where investment can happen. And that fell right within the, both municipal government and central government's pro-development model, which was essentially, from 1970 on, focus on, on urban growth and focus on the city, uh, which there's no taxation. There's no like property tax or income tax within China. So the only way that a municipal government can, can raise funds are through a one-time sales tax to a developer of the land. So what that does, like if you're a mayor of a city, which you're appointed, you're not elected, you gotta remember to, and you're gonna impress upon, this goes to the museums, you're gonna build those too. You want to impress upon your superiors, so you'll get, you know, you're gonna get your, your promotion to do anything. What, and it, it may be all good things you're trying to do, you need to raise capital. So how you raise capital is through single you know, development of city. So what happens is a vicious cycle, right? You gotta just keep building. What, what worked well for, for many in China is then that gave a place for those with this now burgeoning income to invest that money. And so therefore, when you see, when you, when you see something about ghost cities, whatever, those are owned. They're just not lived in. Right, those, those are all, those have been speculative, they're all speculative. So those, so, and you have entire, you have entire super blocks that are empty, but they are 100% sold, right? Because it is in their stories, and you can go on, you can imagine that even it was a developer that we did some work with, that you just, you show up in Beijing with your suitcase of cash, and you buy seven units, 
and that's it. You're never going to live in them. Never going to rent them. Doesn't need to. It's the it's only in the few places you can put your money, right? So, so you have that, and then you have the housing, the crisis of housing. Actually, all those millions, but but those millions don't necessarily get into those apartments, right? So, the expectation within China is that there still be 250 million people moving from the countryside into the city within the next 15, 20 years. I mean, it's even a little quicker than that, but just let's just not be so exaggerated, perhaps. So there's still a huge demand for housing. The problem is then in the financing, right? And then they're overextended on the financing, all of that. The 250 people, 50 million people moving to the city are not living in those, uh, those complexes which are now under threat of bankruptcy and everything else because they're migrant workers that are working, are going to work in service jobs or working in, um, um, you know, in labor jobs and things like that, right? So affordable housing and all that is, has a huge deficit. Like when the, when the government gave up, went to the free market, then gave up the responsibility of housing everybody, what happened is then everyone had to afford where they lived, right? So now it is, it is so unaffordable for so many people to live in the city, they live in those informal settlements, right, that we we're talking about, right? So that's where they end up having to live. Even like recent college graduates live in those kind of situations. So what, what happens is that the kind of situation that we have, there's still a huge need because the cities are continuing to grow, but we have a huge surplus of development, of offices, of, of, of luxury apartments, that there's no longer a market for that, and then we have hundreds of millions of people who need to find a place to live, right? And it's not so different than here and other places. We have the same struggles in America, right? But so that's, that's kind of that situation. And now they're recognizing that model, this, this sort of pro-development cycle is, is they, they busted, right? It's, it's broken because what happened, the government used to bail it out every time, the banks out. So, so now they're hitting a moment. So it's a good question, right? Yeah. Any further questions? Don't leave yet. Oh, wait. We do I got to draw for the books. And then after the final question or question, we will give it out the books. Yeah. This is a real quick one. Did Slice Karate block your wall? That one has not, no. But it's the same concept. Same concept. It, it's a little bit harder to put a wall around that, that because it's like also elevated on these steps and it's like a, it's a podium. You kind of go up these large steps and it'd be a little harder to do. And that, that, that development's more commercial than the linked hybrid was mostly residential. So the, the Slice Karate block is a com mostly commercial development. So offices and things like that so there's not there are guards everywhere I mean there are still guards but there's no wall yet so well, the, the problem was is that there was undesirables or something that populated the yeah public that's area. the perception I think and the idea from the developers point of view is one you can't charge the same amount of rent or for the sale of that because it doesn't have a wall it's not exclusive Right, and, and whatever perception it might be, whether it's crime to, you know, whatever. Uh, why are all these strangers warming around our super block, you know, every day? You know, we've got to put a wall around it. So, so anyway, it's disappointing. But again, you know, it's, a, it's a, again, it just shows that there are, there, we have to look at an objective way, too. You know? Yeah.